we'll make a start. Um, I'm sorry that there aren't more people here because this is really a matter of life and death and uh, careers in academia that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I don't think we have answers, but we certainly have a lot of questions. I'm Jean Anderson. I'm from Victoria University in Wellington, where I set up the New Zealand Centre for Literary Translation in 2000 and something, seven. Um, and our other panellists are in order. Russell Scott Valentino, whom I probably don't need to introduce, he's current president of ALTA, and Geoffrey Ancrum, whom I'm sure some of you have already heard talking about some of the legalities and complexities of copyright. Um, and he's, I don't think he's got the answers today either, but he's got some plans. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is what the implications are of this increasing pressure to have all PhD theses and some master's theses deposited in electronic form so that they are thereby released into the world at large in due course. Um, I think there are actually three main areas of concern, and if you have a message to take back to your respective institutions, I think you should also bear in mind that we're not just talking about literary translation. There are some particular issues around that. We're not just talking about creative writing programs or other creative um, areas within the arts, uh, although there are issues there. There are also some very major implications for all PhD theses. Um, and as we'll see from the handout in a little while, the universities that are onto these kinds of things, and I'm thinking here of places like Oxford and Cambridge and some of the world leading universities, are onto this already and are advising their students to put off the electronic deposit as long as possible uh, for reasons that I will come to hopefully shortly. Um, my main concern here is a personal one because it seems like every two years we have the same conversation with the administration. We make the case for creative writing and literary translation practice-based uh, thesis work to be excluded from this compulsory electronic deposit. We have support from the university's copyright lawyer and then two years later we have the same conversation because we are told it is a legal requirement. Uh, if research is publicly funded, it must be publicly available. Now, interestingly, just last week, I finally got round to asking our Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Research if he could point me in the direction of the relevant law, to which he responded, I don't know where you heard this. I have certainly never said it. And I can't find the email in which he certainly <laughs> did. So we're looking at a requirement which certainly in New Zealand is not a legal requirement. There is no law that covers this. It's possible that the Freedom of Information Act uh, of, I think, 1992 could be invoked to get some of this data released uh, to an individual member of the public requesting it. Um, and I know from talking to Lynn Penrod here that the Canadian situation is different. So we have a global issue um, which has different jurisdictions, different sets of laws applying in different contexts. So as I said, I don't think we have answers for you today, but I'd at least like to tease out some of the problems. Um, We have been told in the case of literary translation practice-based theses that it is the student's responsibility to ensure that copyright uh, is met, co copyright requirements. I have tried to point out that where translation is into English, you're essentially expecting a publisher to give you worldwide English language translation rights which no student I know of could possibly afford. Um, even if the university had a fund for students to apply to, <laughs> the university couldn't afford to cover these things. 
So there are some financial implications. There are certainly legal implications. One of the ones that we've discussed at some length um, internally is who is actually responsible if there is a coffee, copyright infringement in this way because the student doesn't actually publish the thesis, the university does. So my interpretation of that, I am not a lawyer and I have no legal training, would be that the university is liable if there is an infringement. The student didn't publish the work. The student did a thesis. The university then decided to make that available worldwide and if as I said, the student couldn't afford the worldwide English language rights, then surely that's the university's liability. I'm sure <coughs> Jeffrey will shoot me down in flames shortly. <laughs> but it's an argument that has had a limited success so far. Um, how, how are various universities managing this? I have a handout. It's just behind you on the desk next to you. Um, in which I have just gathered together some rather random information about what happens in various universities. As I said, there's not a great deal of clarity about different types of thesis, and most of the advice that's being given to students applies globally to all PhD theses. And as you will see if you work your way down the list, most of the big names are already telling students to take the longest possible embargo term, at least two to five years, um, and most of those big name universities are quite happy to grant those exemptions. And they have their own reasons for that. Um, obviously, if we move on, there, there's a question here about what publication actually is. Is putting a thesis, one copy, in the library publication? I have been told that this is a form of publication, in which case the Modern Languages Association is going to have to stop advising us to refer to unpublished theses because clearly there's no such thing. Um, publication in that format is obviously very different from sending it out on the internet to whoever can Google. Universities, uh, I assume these, these ones who are a little bit more on the ball, are presumably aware that uh, it's not in their best interests for their best and brightest students to not be able to publish their work in book form. So that, that's, I'm referring there to PhD theses more globally. If as some documents that I've seen in getting ready for this panel, if for universities this open access thing is a matter of storefront and making the world at large aware of how wonderful that university is in what areas, then they are also shooting themselves in the foot in terms of the book publication, and I don't know how your research evaluation exercises work but in my country, if I said, oh yes, I put that on the internet, um, as opposed to, yes, it's a book, uh, I imagine that would be a difference of zero points in the first case and 10 or eight or something a bit more respectable in the second. So I don't see how they can have their cake and eat it too. But that is the nature of power, presumably. So, what are the concerns? As I've said, and this is just to sum up, there are at least three threads to this already immensely complicated discussion. One is that if we're going to put all of the PhDs in electronic form out on the internet, then it is a serious threat to book publication. Um, some of these universities are advising students to check with potential publishers before they decide whether or not to make the electronic deposit. This is largely British universities I'm talking about. Um, in the case of copyright issues around practice-based translation projects, obviously you won't probably find a publisher 
ready to fund your already, we all know translations are far too expensive to produce, you won't find them willing to put that investment into a book publication if it's already available to anyone who can Google. The issue over the rights, I can foresee this being a massive problem. Um, assuming you can negotiate with the publisher, I have a student who has had clearance from a French publisher to do a translation within the framework of a thesis, but I would be prepared to bet that if that publisher knew that that meant stick it on the internet afterwards, there would be no authorization or permission. Publishers rely on selling translation rights to make a business, and they're not about to just cheerfully sign them away. There is one interesting case, and if you'd like to look at the top of the handout, the City University of London, um, they, have, they run an MA in translating popular culture, uh, which covers things like comics, um, graphic novels, beg your pardon, um, popular fiction of various kinds. And they have had a number of cases where MA students, and they don't have practice-based PhDs, so they can only do this at MA level. Um, they have, in fact, contacted publishers for permission and ended up with contracts and book publication. I think that in the case of City University of London, they have a lot of students from Europe who are translating from English into um, less global languages. And I suspect one of the reasons for the success is A, that they're close to Europe. There's, there's a sort of network already in existence there. And the other is that they are translating into Italian or German or Polish. <coughs> Excuse me. That's quite a different situation from someone who wants to translate into English, I suspect. Although I'm interested to hear um, from Rainer Schulter at UTD that they haven't had any problems obtaining rights for uh, translations. See, that's something I should have explored further with him, but I haven't had time. And the third stream, and perhaps Russell, you might be talking a little bit more about this too, is what happens with creative writing projects where the original creative work is online and readily available. As I said, which publisher do we know of who will pick up something that's already out there? Uh, and uh, Lynn Penrod from Canada was earlier talking about the fact that um, this applies to set design, all kinds of humanities areas where all the specs, the drawings, everything is going to be out there and available for anyone who wants to pick them up and use them with or without authorization potentially. So those I think are the three main areas for concern. Um, as I said, we're getting very different policies from different universities around the world, even within the same country. Um, there's different interpretations being made of what exactly this implies. Um, I think, and we were talking earlier about potentially killing someone's career if your thesis cannot become the really important first book on whatever, what does that do to the stepping stone for a career in academia? So there are lots of consequences. Um, Russell had suggested that he might talk about some actual case histories, uh, flesh out some of the potential difficulties, and then we'll hand on to Jeffrey, <laughs> as I said, to solve all the problems, but possibly not. And hopefully we'll have lots of, t lots of time for questions and perhaps if you've got illustrations from your own experience that would be useful for us to hear as well. Thank you. Great. So uh, I'm going to sit here. I don't have anything to project, so I will speak up, make sure you can hear me. Uh, first I want to sketch a tiny bit more the, the pressure on the institution to make theses available, theses and dissertations, and theses might include undergraduate theses. Uh, honors theses. 
uh, it's not, uh, in my experience, it, it isn't, if you're the graduate dean or the undergraduate, the dean of undergraduate affairs and you're, you're charged with doing this, it's not so much a question of legality. They're not told you are a public institution, therefore you must put all these things online. Uh, at least not in American institutions. U.S. institutions haven't faced that issue uh, as, a, as a rationale. It's more a question of outcomes, measuring outcomes, having data, being able to say we have X time to degree, uh, here is our placement rate, and then here are the products. Um, and graduate deans and undergraduate administration officials are under some pressure to be able to show their, the outcomes that, that their institution has. They're, they're, they're expected to do that. And I think that has increased in recent years. They're expected to show results, some kind of results. And then, then they want to compare programs with programs at one institution and another institution, sometimes within the same institution. And in order to do that, they need data. And if you're filing your thesis in the library, that's not data. <laughs> and they want it online. They want it uh, tangible, easy to get to, so that they can start creating what they call metrics, which is their way of comparing apples and oranges. <laughs> because no two programs are the same, no two institutions are the same, so they want to create a metric that enables them to compare these, these things that are not the same. And the only way you can do that is by creating data. Google comes along and says, hey, we can help you with this. We've got infrastructure. We want content. And at this point, the equation starts to sound a little bit like a lot of academic publishing in general. The academics are doing the research as part of their job. Then it gets published as part of their job, which they're paid for. And then the publisher gets to do with it what they want. <laughs> Right? And the publisher is relying on this free, basically free labor model to have this content. And that's what Google is doing as well. They, they look at this generation of content by faculty and now by students and say, we can solve your problem for you by, by having a data infrastructure and we'll plug in all the data. Just give, just give us a PDF and we're ready to go. And you can then have the data that you need to, to do what you need to do and respond to the pressures that you have in your institution and across institutions. And then the, the, the problem then becomes the fact that Google has just made this data, their, the actual content, available. Now whether that rises to the level of a copyright infringement is now being debated all the time. And I think the latest decision is in favor of Google that it's not a copyright infringement, that it's considered a transformation, that the snippet function it doesn't, doesn't constitute an infringement, it's just making data available or making content available. People can't download it and they can't print it. And they can compare things and it's a it's sufficient transformation that um, it's not considered illegal. Google so far has won that battle and they, they seem to be winning that battle. What's really interesting, I find that this is like a kind of a double speak. What's really interesting about it is in the same set of decisions that I've read, and Jeffrey, you can talk about this more, uh, translation is constantly referred to as derivative. Mm. So you can't claim fair use for a translation. Your translation needs to have permission. But if then you've created a translation in the context of a university structure where you didn't get permission, and Google takes it and puts it online, Google has not violated any copyright <laughs> laws according to the latest decisions because they transformed it in a manner that is sufficient to correspond to the fair use doctrine. But you didn't. <laughs> so you are liable and maybe the university is liable. I don't know. That's, that's the part where it gets kind of fishy. I'm not exactly sure. So the, at that stage, We've entered a new, a new domain where these other considerations that Jean brought up come into play. And I would add a third, which is the question of dissemination of knowledge, which is what, what universities are supposed to be doing. And if you embargo 
the results of years of research for years, they're not disseminating any knowledge. They're not doing what they should have done or should be doing. In many cases, they're charged to do that. They're charged to do that as, as well as being public institutions. They're charged to, to build on the, this is a science model, obviously, to build on the knowledge of previous generations and disseminate that to the world so that we can build on that further. And this new equation or this new, this new technology that could be developed by something based on research done in your institution doesn't happen because there's an embargo on the, on the thesis. That's, a, that's a, an additional consideration. The, the careers one is, is palpable, where you have a thesis that is the translation of two-thirds of a novel, let's say, or three-fourths of a book of poetry, or it's an anthology of poems based on a criteria that you've, you've developed as part of your thesis um, research. They're not finished. They're part of your thesis. It's part of an apparatus. You've got a little introduction. You've got some notes. You wouldn't publish it that way necessarily if it went into book form. And yet, it's all available. All the stuff that you did is available. And that has happened. Um, and uh, the, so the nightmare scenario is uh, you unknowingly do what the university tells you to do, which is file your thesis electronically. And, and then the summer after you graduate, you, you email your thesis advisor, which is me, and, and it's, uh, I just found that my thesis is available and I didn't ask permission from the authors or the rights holders and what do I do, how do I get it taken down? Well, the answer is, it'll never come down. Uh, I mean, you can try, but it's always going to be available somewhere at some point. Um, you can trace it. So. Uh, at, th at that point, then it becomes backtracking and trying to say, L let's, let's take it down, graduate college. Um, and so this is, again, something that has happened on numerous occasions. It happened to me while I was at Iowa with students filing theses, theses and then finding out that, that um, this was in the initial stages of the digitization revolution. And they had signed a contract with Google, and th th that's exactly what the scenario was. They were hoping to use the data that Google was going to provide as part of their desire for content to create metrics and use, use them as part of the graduate college's mm -hmm. um, measurements for success among a variety of programs. That included the translation MFA, that included, included the writer's workshop, included everybody. And so the response from those programs was to not to embargo, but to go and look for some of these exemptions, exactly like mm -hmm. uh, Melbourne uh, mm -hmm. Monash does, uh, mm -hmm. or no, the University of East Anglia. So they say uh, PhD theses often practice-based exemption from e-deposit is almost routine. Now it's almost routine at Iowa to have the exemption, but uh, in order for that to happen, the graduate dean has to know about it, the person who oversees the intake of the theses has to know about it, it has to be on the website, it has to be in the graduate student mm -hmm. manual, all the graduate advisors need to know about it, and there needs to be a form that you routinely provide to the students that says, check, I do not want, it has to be a simple form, check, mm -hmm. I do not want my thesis electronically deposited. What happens then? It goes in the library the same way theses have always gone in the library, and it's available through interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get it. You just and libraries are good at coordinating that. Mm -hmm. They've done it for a long, long time. There's nothing unpublic about that. It's available. Yeah. I don't know if it's published or not. What I don't I don't know about that. The technical definition of publishing it, but it is definitely available to anybody who wants yeah. to get it. In some cases. The library will make a copy of a chapter and send it to you. I mean, it, it, they really do those sort of cert sorts of services. It does not restrict knowledge in any way. Um, it's not as readily available, mm. but you can get the whole thing sent mm. to you, mm. and you can read it. Um, and that's a, I think that's a perfectly reasonable solution <laughs> for most, many at least, maybe not most, uh, because as I say, this argument about dissemination of knowledge could be made uh, for some of the disciplines. Um, and it's easier when it's online, it's true. And for some disciplines, they don't care so much. They're not thinking that they're going to publish that, P that PhD thesis mm -hmm. in physics or organic chemistry mm -hmm. as a book. They're probably mm -hmm. not. 
they're going to publish some articles based on it. And yeah, you had a question? Permission. Permission, even with that extension. And, um, and what did they say? They didn't know. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> surprise. Right, so, so there's, well, I'm not sure where it came from, but the, the, so you mean the option to copyright? Um, I was just, do I need permission? Uh, if it's not going to be disseminated uh, publicly, but it's still going to be available, like if I had a library of honors copyrights. So okay, so so uh, I, my argument and I and what we and what we put in place, while I was there, and I think it's still in place. I don't think they've changed it in the two years since I left. Was that um, if you insist on students trying to get permission to publish things, you're going to kill the program. Yeah, that's not a good way to support your program. Um, the way we've always done it, the way we had always done it up until then for 40, 50 years, whatever it was, was the way I just described. You don't have to ask anybody for anything. Mm -hmm. Anybody can translate anything, actually, if you want. But then after that, that's the question. If you're going to then use it as part of a thesis, um, it never came up in the past, it's part of a thesis that has an apparatus that goes with it, which is, you, you probably do this in architecture, I think you do. You have a, an introduction of some kind which contextualizes the work. You might talk about translation problems that you've faced, the uh, history of the author, the genre, things, uh, that sort of thing. You might have glossary, you might have notes, right? That's part of a, it's an academic project. That's a fair use project. And it's gonna go in the library, the way all theses used to go in the library. I think you could probably win that argument. Jeffrey, you can tell me if you think I'm right. We never had to make the argument in the past. And so that's, that's the line that we drew, and they, they bought it. They said, okay, mm -hmm. exemption from uh, uh, E, deposit, mm -hmm. and go ahead and continue doing it the way you've always done it. No permissions necessary. Can I, can I just add to that that we have had that model agreed to uh, probably three times now? Uh, but that each time they we, we come it. back to this, yes, yeah. but you know, it's not an electronic deposit. And so things probably are going to just shift backwards and forwards. If they haven't in Iowa, <laughs> kudos. Um, it's shifting sands in our case. I agree, anyone can translate anything, anyone can put that into the body of a thesis which traditionally a thesis is not a publication. If you then insist on it being published and internet is where the real issue arises, um, then that completely changes the situation. We have a very simple form, but invariably the students who need to say, please don't make this electronically available, uh, there's pressure on them as individual students. Right, I've seen the wording the in some of the letters, and it's really quite alarming. Yeah, they have to take the initiative to say, no, I don't want yeah, that. Yeah, they do. And there is another um, related issue, which has just gone out of my head, and we'll come back, mm -hmm. um, which has to do with... <sighs> no, it will come back. Sorry, we had a question there. Yeah, I think. yeah I just have a question. Is there a model for the exemption form that you mentioned? Is there a model for the exemption form that you mentioned? I can send you one of ours. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a very Take simple. Take it back and fight for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, I can tell you exactly what it said. I mean, it, or almost. It just said, I, I as, as oh. your name of the thesis, name of the student, um, I request exemption from the e-deposit, sign the form and date. Mm. That that's what mm. that's the form we created. Mm. Um, so there's nothing fancy legal about it, just that. That's that's the form that we had, and uh, yeah. that's what they. I think that's what you, they you, used. You you need to have library agreement and admin agreement that this is a possible option for a student to select. Um, I'd be happy to send you a copy of our form. 
the, the thing that escaped me was um, that sometimes it's difficult to ascertain who actually holds the rights yeah. for translation. Uh, I've had one instance of a Canadian student, in fact, who had asked the author, uh, and there it was online, and I said, but does the author actually have the rights? And it disappeared offline. So presumably the answer was no. Right. Um, and that's that's sometimes very difficult to find out and who what actually are they has do? the right. Track down, track down the descendants for try find the estate. <laughs> yeah. the, I mean, this, this was a living author. Not, but they're not yeah. going to do that. Yeah. So I, I want to make sure I understand. So sh the student asked for an embargo uh, of the graduate college at Arkansas? No, the graduate college didn't uh, grant that. But it was actually the program. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so th mm -hmm. what we're talking about is a, a stage before that. It never gets yeah, digitized. I that. But yeah. They have an Arkansas right that have had some success with that so far. Really? But at the level of They have, and, and when I was at the Iowa Review, even we, I remember f finding we, one of our authors wrote to me saying, "I just found some of my poems at ProQuest for four ninety five a piece." Uh, it was we didn't authorize it; they just started selling them. Thank you. 
can't abide by our decree, then you won't receive any funding from us, which of course makes any public university, any university go, oh, well, sure. we have to be online and we have to be in favor of open access. The situation at the moment, as I see it, is that we are all still trying to figure out what the definition of as genus, you've already said, what is a publication? What is an embargo? What does that do to what Russell has talked about, the dissemination of knowledge that we are also, in terms of the granting agency, we're responsible for disseminating if we have their money. So if it's open access and then we end up with researchers, whether they're students or open faculty members who are having their careers damaged, whether in terms of faculty evaluation or students able to get, um, get jobs, um, I'm not sure we know exactly what we're going to do. So some of the, the, um, the procedures adopted by British universities or American universities, we, we, we try to use those, but now I don't know how they're going to stand up under scrutiny. Uh, my, my big fear is, and I was going to add just, just earlier, under the, the dangers that plagiarism now comes in under all, all of those categories. And the scary thing is mm -hmm. that, you know, how as a supervisor or as a student or as someone who translates or works in these areas, how do you keep up with trying to track on the internet what may be out there um, that you didn't even know was out there? Mm -hmm. So the, the really sad cases that I've dealt with are people who've done, students uh, who've done everything right and institutions who back to the student and it's still out there and and then there's really not much recourse because it's very hard to get things back once they once they've mm -hmm. been out there. Even if it's a partial translation, that can take somebody a pretty long way um, to getting a full translation mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry to be so long with you. <laughs> Jeffrey, are you ready? Sure. Yeah. Uh, can, can we carry on sure, now? And we'll Plenty of time for questions later, I think. Jeffrey. Yeah. And if, you'll, if you'll forgive me, I, f I think it will be easier for me to use the lectern. Yes. Uh, just in terms of seeing and being it's seen. It's easier to breathe standing up. <laughs> it's true. Is it? Uh, okay. And I'll also bring this along so I can watch time a little bit. Um, so I'm Jeff Ankrum. Nothing I say will be legal advice. I'm not admitted to practice in the state of Arizona. And uh, I will dodge some questions specifically for that reason. Uh, but I think there are some legal issues that we can at least bring in some information on. Um, I'll back up just a little bit and reflect on how we got here. The open access movement was born because in the sciences, work was being published in journals that could cost $5,000 a year for a subscription, where people were having to pay very substantial funds in order to be published. And much of that work did have some, some kind of government subsidy. So the argument was made, the government, the people through the government are funding the research, they're paying for publication, then our universities using public funds are strapped to pay for all of these journals, and then the journals are being bought up by large conglomerates that keep running up the prices. And so we're paying for our colleagues, for access to our colleagues' work. So the solution is proposed for the sciences to start publishing in open access. Mm -hmm. And the uh, 
some of the solutions for the sciences have been elegant. The Public Library of Science, PLOS, wonderful online resource. It's worked well for many of the sciences. But the juggernaut kept moving, and these solutions were not well adapted for the humanities. In science, it was important to have speedy publication. And for them, getting, getting their article out there, getting their research out there quickly was very valuable. Look over to sciences and uh, the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, the American Historical Association has called for an eight-year embargo on publication of dissertations. You think about it, for many people that dissertation can have data and work that will be mined for several book projects. And you know, the, the problem of undermining a career by forcing out data that somebody spent a long time in archives to come up with, but at the dissertation uh, level, hasn't had time to really develop the interpretation and make full use of. Uh, so I think you know, open access has had many wonderful aspects, but for, for translators, it's created an absolute nightmare and a real legal mess. Uh, I'm going to go in a somewhat unsystematic fashion and just address some of the questions that have come up. There is good reason to be confused about what we mean by publication. There are different legal meanings for publication in different contexts. So why are a lot of science dissertations embargoed for two years? In most of the world, if you publish, if you make public your invention or uh, new system, you lose the, capacity, the possibility of patenting at that instant. In the United States, if you publish your invention, you have one year to file for a patent. If you don't file within that year, it's lost. What does publication mean when it comes to invention of a device? It has been found that having a dissertation sitting on the shelf in a university was publication for purposes of patent. Showing a neighbor whom you had invited over for dinner your invention and how it worked was deemed to be publication. So for some students and faculty in the university, publication may mean holding up something saying, look what I invented, you see how it works? That can be publication. Under copyright law, when we're dealing with whether we're publishing a translation of a work, the legal definition in the US, Canadian law is a bit different, other systems are a bit different, but in the US, making a copy available to the public. So if you have it posted online and it can be bought from ProQuest, if it's up there in a PDF and it can be downloaded, that is publication. If a, if you've uh, made a chat book and you distribute it to friends as a New Year's gift, that's generally considered sort of private circulation. It's not being made available to the public. And there is, of course, some gray area in between the two. So there are cases that have gone to court to try to tease out whether something has been published within uh, within the within copyright law, but that's that's the basic standard for copyright. If a copy is made available to the public, um, the 
I think sometimes when, when this sort of major change comes along, we respond with, with two tacks. And I think what may be needed here is a short-term sort of Band-Aid, first aid, uh, perhaps a defensive approach, especially in institutions where the administration is not being helpful or where you're facing national law or, or regulation, forcing publication. Students may be told for this project, for you as a student, you need to work either with something in the public domain or something for which you can get permission. When you're facing legal uncertainties, you know, we'd like to get things cleaned up, but when there's a possibility of liability, uh, the choice of the text to translate might need to be more conservative. Uh, in the longer term, I believe what is needed is to get these stories pulled together. When you go to an administrator or perhaps in Canada to a, to a legislator and say, these policies are being very damaging, one of the first things they'll want, they will ask, you know, can you show me that people are actually being harmed? Is there really a problem? And we need to have a, a ready answer. Names, addresses, telephone numbers, and descriptions of what happened with those people. So real problems, evidence of real problems that need to be solved. Two, we need information pulled together so we can say, here are the organizations that are protesting the sort of policy that is there. And I'm hoping that we may be able to get such statements, you know, perhaps through ALTA, perhaps through PEN, perhaps through Authors Guild, perhaps through the British Society of Authors. The stakeholders in this situation, certainly bringing in the, the, uh, the, the statement from the American uh, Historical uh, Association and others. If you go to administrators and they have to answer to others who are wanting this, we have to make it easy for them to do the right thing. And by assembling the evidence that they would need to persuade others, we can be more effective advocates. Um, yeah, pardon me for... Uh, in the United States, there's been a movement toward where Canada has gone. At this point, if your project has gotten funding, it, this isn't happening to us, but in other departments, if funding has been received from the National Institutes of Health, I think the current period is a six month embargo. And then the research findings have to go online. There have been calls to expand that to a much wider area that may pass, it might not, but it's certainly in the air in the United States. Um, so I think we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, I, think it, I think our best hope is to get adv advocacy from groups who are in a position to collect the information and make it available to those who need it. So I'm hoping that Alta may be able to be of some service there. So, to can, you, can you say something uh, uh, about the fair use uh, argument um, and the transformation of a text? So, if we put it inside a thesis and and analyze things that are in it, as opposed to just translating the book and putting that mm -hmm. book as part as the thesis. Sure. See what I mean. So. Uh, I'll, I'll back up just a, just a smidge. In the 1660s, <laughs> you know, the scientific revolution comes along, the Royal Society is established, and just this, this watershed in intellectual history. 
comes along and it's understood that, that scholars need to be able to demonstrate what they do and it's the notion that a scholar has a duty to publish, to make public the findings. And so that's, as, as you brought up, there's that sense that that's part of our responsibility, especially within academic institutions. There's a responsibility to put out the findings of what we've learned. Copyright law says if you are the creator of the work or if the creator has passed rights to you, you get to restrict the flow of that information. There's an exception there in American law and US law for fair use, saying, requiring you to look at five different points to sort of weigh out, to, to, to tease out whether this is a fair use or not. One of those is what purpose you're making of, of the text. And if you're using a portion of something in instruction, in scholarship, that counts toward fair use. You have to look at all of the elements to make a determination of fair use. Um, so part of it, yes, it's being used in learning, in scholarship. One thing that favors a finding of fair use, so you don't have to get permission, you can't end up in trouble for, for making use, is if your use is transformative. So if you have changed the work in some way so that what you're using really isn't going to replace that original work. So if Google has scanned whole books and people can search and they just see snippets, that's not going to replace the purchase or the sale of the whole book. So that's why the Google scanning case, there was a finding that that was fair use. And that's considered transformative. That is, the court found that transformative. I see, yeah. It was, some people have been surprised. Yeah. <laughs> but that was considered transformative. With translation, I think one, why is it called derivative? In the copyright statutes, the probably most important section, if you're going to read anything in American copyright law, read section 101 of the copyright code. That's the definitions. The most, you know, that's sort of the mother load. And the definition for derivative work, you know, translation is the classic derivative work. It takes that original work and makes a direct use of it. So is a translation fair use? The translation can replace the purchase of the original work. So the translation itself is sort of a classic not fair use if you've got the whole thing there. Uh, and a, and I'm a, sorry. And you can watch a movie. So a movie can replace your, the, a film adaptation is also derivative, right? Uh, I think it is in the. It's. I think it you is. You know, I, I think that's. They always say if, if you ask a lawyer, especially a good lawyer, any question, what's for lunch? It depends. <laughs> Uh, so, if it's a really bad film adaptation, uh, <laughs> it is, it's farther, Transformative. it's farther from being a direct use, uh -huh. but if, if you can recognize the work, it's, uh, it's getting really iffy. Uh, no, it's like generally a film adaptation, while it, you know, it's basically a derivative work, but it is farther out there than translation some others can, can uh, I just ask yeah. uh, one of the areas in which we've had debate in my institution had to do with whether a translation was like a performance of something so you, you've got the music 
and the translation is the performance of the music. Is is that that would be what um, is that? Well, I'll say the <laughs> author of a work. No, no. Yeah. The, the the author of a work also you know, part of the copyright is the right to public performance. So a public mm -hmm. reading of a text would be addressed under the public performance right mm -hmm. of the copyright. Uh, putting a copy online is the right to make a copy or to publish to make copies mm -hmm. available. And so public performance is just another facet of copyright. Uh, it's, I always, I always say copyright is the most complex, it's the nerdiest area of law next to tax, and perhaps, and I would say just about as metaphysical as tax. Um, so, I, I think with other things, I've made the points I really wanted to make. If there are questions, we can. Pursue on I, I wonder if, uh, I, I'm, if I could, I, I like the idea you, uh, you suggested about public, um, about responding to the, the challenges by looking at your program and uh, modifying the program somewhat rather than trying to fight. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Fight, and so you look at a translation program. And you say, "Well, let's let's restrict the program to public domain works." Um, that could be really interesting. Uh, it does change the nature of a lot oh, of programs. Yeah. I mean, they really fo people focus on contemporary works because that's what yeah. often what they gets them interested yeah. in it. Sure, but um, you can still do plenty with contemporary works without making them your theses. Yeah, right, that mm. you can be, they can be workshopped, they can be developed mm. in other forms. You can do all mm. sorts of things before you get to the st thesis stage, and the thesis stage is a, is a public domain mm. work. And there are plenty of good public domain works that are not translated or have been translated badly. Mm. And a lot more, actually, discussion you could have about public domain works and in ways. Yeah. The retranslation is fascinating. That, that's also a really interesting mm. domain. So. That, that, that's not a bad tack to take, is to look at your own program and say, how could we transform our program in order to not fall into this, this problem? Yeah, uh, I, I think another possibility would be for a director of, of a translation program in a university to call up the director of a publishing house that has a substantial list of, 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 of works, or that's, you know, uh, I guess, you know, you get a hold of people who control rights for a large corpus of works that would be of interest to the, the students and say, is there any way that I could sort of count on being able to have a student get in touch with you, ask for permission to do something as a project for school oh, and get some sort of smooth passage for reaching a decision. You mean um, the foreign publisher? Yeah, the, uh, the foreign publisher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if there's an agent for that, that publisher in, in the US. Yeah. And you know, perhaps work things out so there's a safe list. Yeah. Uh, for shorter projects, things like the French Publishers Agency would love to have uh, translations of chapters mm -hmm. from works, the rights for which are available. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. if there's a possibility, one, of finding safe works, and two, just building into the program some more training on how to get rights and permissions, and you might even be able to get a local lawyer to come and Sure, that can be part of the program, help. professionalization mm -hmm. part of the program. That's it should I be. Was, I, while we were, you were speaking, it, it just occurred to me that um, most of these discussions have gone on among people who work with the program, supervisors, administrators, mm -hmm. and we're all sort of running around trying to figure out what all of this means for the social scientists and the humanists. But um, it, it really ought to be a part of the graduate program, we have all this a series of workshops. 
else on you know, writing apps, doing all these wonderful things. It might not be a bad idea just to have a, a, a very clear course series of workshops where we get people to come and at least lay out the problem. I was, I was of course, reminded when you did the science, the science mm -hmm. thing about why open access started. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people who don't, who don't know that. You reminded me of it, but I know we have lots of graduate students who, who don't really understand this. And if we, if we had a, a, a better sort of information ground level, uh, it, might, it might help us get some, mm -hmm. some traction. But changing the program uh, in terms of what we actually do for the thesis part of it and what we do for projects that we enter into yeah and and within the British system um, there aren't courses oh, often well, attached yes, to masters are. or PhD yeah. so there isn't going to be an obvious opportunity to do the contemporary stuff which ironically enough we're also under pressure from our government to demonstrate that uh, what we are training our students to do is is of real world usefulness, um, and so nineteenth century <laughs> is is not going to actually probably be very persuasive, other than by pointing out that it is the general skills training that goes in there. But where we would fit in contemporary under that thesis only model is. It could happen, um, but it's not as obvious, I think, yeah. from that point of view. And actually, I'll, I'll modify my earlier suggestion. If instead of having the head of a university translation program speak with, another, with, with a foreign publisher, if, if the head of an organization that can help get information to its members saying, I'm in contact with translation programs around, you know, throughout the U.S. And we have a problem. It's hard for us to clear permissions for translation students. Uh, perhaps you have works on your list that are not particularly likely to attract commercial trans translation uh, but you'd like some attention drawn to those works. Is there any way that we can help each other here? Um, if some communications could actually open a path for multiple institutions, this would be a lovely thing. It would. It's easy for me to say because I wouldn't be the one doing <laughs> the hard work. So. You will be, did you say? Ah. Uh, <laughs> did you? I'll, I'll be no. doing other hard work. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, digging around online trying to find if uh, the author I'm working on is he's a uh, Russian author, Andrei Kultanovitz, and uh, international public domain or Russian public domain, and I was having trouble finding that information. Is there a resource online? Um, that depends. I couldn't resist. Uh, first, there's, there's really no such thing as international public domain. So a public domain is according to, so what really matters is if you're working in this country, is it in the public domain where you're working? So if you are, if you're moving to Iran and you're going to do your work there and there's no recognition for his copyright in Iran, you're home free. If you're crossing, you know, if, if you go, you decide you want to move to Egypt and there, you know, his work is under copyright, you got a problem. So you just need to look at whether it's in the public domain where you are or where you plan to publish. So if you really want the book to be distributed in England, US, Canada, you need to look at whether you need permission in those places. But but isn't that exactly the problem we're talking about with with internet? Um, that we, we don't control which country 
it's available in? I'll put it this way. If, um, if I write something very nasty about Zimbabwe, I'm and, and I publish it on in, in a, in a blog or a newspaper, I'm almost certainly violating Zimbabwean uh, mm -hmm. press laws. Mm -hmm. And a British journalist was just fine until he went to Zimbabwe. So if you're violating copyright law in countries you will never visit, where you have no access, where you will never stop in the airport, uh, huh. it, it doesn't matter. Isn't that why on this is not legal advice. No. Get real <laughs> legal advice before, yeah. before traveling. It's why sometimes you can't see a video that someone else has posted, yeah. and you will get a message. Mm. You, 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 mm. your Cross the zone. Area, your zone can't look at this, not because you because it is under some kind mm. of copyright uh, restriction. Yeah. So, but, uh, I mean, oh. Jesse, to, ask, to answer your uh, question, I just write directly to Robert Chandler yeah. and ask him how, because he's translated a lot of Platonov in the, in the UK, and see whether he has had to get permission or his publisher has had to get permission. He should know. Platon was a great case because he was writing during the so early Soviet period. I don't know when he died. I don't know when. Yeah, and so did the family. Has it? I don't know. I don't know anything about what happened there. So he would know them. Ask him. I will Post say to see Lang all the time. I would say some of the most surprisingly spectacularly successful careers have been those of people who have the nerve to phone up the top people in various fields and say, you know, I'm interested in this. Could you answer a question, please? Careers have been built because someone had the nerve to make a phone call, send a letter, show up at a doorstep. So the worst that can happen is you phone someone famous, they don't take the call, get it back, but it's amazing how generous people can be when somebody shows interest. I'm always amazed at Deidre Bear's biography of Samuel Beckett. Um, for years, there was a number of years, I didn't know that was a real Be bold, young person. <laughs> and I, th I think we may be at. Yeah, we're heading close to cutoff time, so very happy to talk to anybody outside the session. But I think we might call it to a close. And thank you very much for coming. I have found it personally extremely informative. You do. Thank <laughs> and you. I hope you have too. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.